NASA. Uh, and you can see that we are definitely uh, front and center in what NASA wants to do. I also wanted to point out after the hard work that the program and the researchers within it have done, that in 2017, we were actually added as number 10 uh, in the list of NASA's objectives. So number 10 is the search for life's origins, evolution, distribution, and future in the universe. So we not only have, know ourselves how important astrobiology is, but Congress does as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about what uh, astrobiology program funding priorities have been, just to let people know in case it seems opaque to you about how we make decisions about how we invest in things or how we change focus from time to time. Um, and this is done by guidance from gaps in our investment portfolio. We, as you all know, we have an astrobiology strategy that has a number of areas of research that are very important to the central question of understanding the origin and evolution of life on Earth and the distribution of life in the universe. We also have identified areas that are important to invest in through topical workshops and studies, both hosted by the National Academies as well as NASA. Um, we also um, sometimes um, invest in a particular area because of our partnerships with other agencies. So we've done a lot of things with NSF. We're doing, currently doing something with NOAA and the US National Ocean Exploration Program. And then there's some national science priorities that have been set by OSTP, like the Microbiome Initiative and Ocean Worlds. And today I'm mostly going to focus on the science needs and support of ongoing and future missions that are related to astrobiology. And I'll talk mostly about things that are upcoming, but of course everybody knows how important basically um, all of the Mars program has been to astrobiology and understanding our closest neighbor and the planet most likely to have been um, potentially like us early in its history. So I'm just going to show you real briefly this planetary science mission events, up and uh, current and up and coming, and focus on what's happening in 2020. We're going to be launching Mars 2020. ESA will launch ExoMars. OSIRIS-REx is going to retrieve a sample at the end of that year, probably later than July, but in the last part of it. Hayabusa will re uh, have its re-entry uh, in Australia. And Mars 2020 may land as early as December of 2020 or early 2021. So next year is going to be a big year. And that's just starting off a really important uh, decade for us. I want to talk a little bit about um, upcoming missions for those of you that don't know. Uh, some of the details about what we're, what we're planning on doing and what's coming up. Uh, many of you know that InSight is on Mars right now. It's, it's designed to understand um, the uh, internal structure of Mars, which is, of course, is really important to astrobiology. We know that things like plate tectonics and the activity of, um, you know, the physical activity and geological activity of Earth has been very important in creating habitable environments as well as sustaining habitability. And we need to understand this about Mars as well in order to understand if it was ever habitable, uh, and support if it ever supported life and if it's currently habitable now and can support life into the future. Our next big mission is Mars 2020, which is going to be seeking signs of ancient life. Uh, it will be doing geological exploration and ancient environments on Mars to understand various geological processes. But of course, important to us is to ac access um, uh, the habitability of ancient environments and seek evidence of past life. Um, the select uh, the selected sampling locations will have the highest bio, uh, pres uh, biosignature uh, preservation. Um, we're also going to be collecting samples and we'll have the capability to collect 40 samples and blanks, uh, 20 are part of the prime mission, and then of course we're going to bring those back uh, and, and interrogate them here on Earth. The other important mission that's happening that we're involved in is the JAXA Martian Moons Exploration, MMX. This is actually an opportunity. It's also a sample return uh, potential. It's going to reveal, hopefully, the origin of Phobos and Deimos and understand processes uh, of the circum-Martian environment by looking at, at these moons. It's scheduled to launch sometime September 2024. Um, but that again, this is something important on Mars in the next decade for us. We have other missions that are flying uh, that are important to astrobiology, and I'm going to touch on a few of those that are coming up. I'll begin with uh, OSIRIS REx, which is Origin Spectral Interpretation, Resource Identification, Security, and Regolith Explorer. 
many of you have been following its um, its launch and entry and surveying of uh, Bennu um, and um, are anxious to find out where they finally decide they're going to take a sample from. So of course one of the biggest discoveries about getting to Bennu was that it was much rougher than we expected. It's not the smooth image that you see in the lower left, but in fact um, it looked more like this. Now this is a video showing you the potential uh, sites to take samples from that they're considering. There are four candidate samples uh, on, on Bennu. Uh, and the final selection uh, of that site will be uh, December 2019. So just next month, we'll know exactly where we're gonna go. And of course, the importance of this mission is to understand uh, something about the early solar system. We hope to learn more about or, uh, organics and volatiles in our own solar system and how, again, the process of, of distribution and delivery potential to Earth uh, uh, may be informed by this mission and these samples. At the same time, uh, we're involved with Hayabusa 2, which is the mission from uh, JAXA, and I mentioned before that it'll be bringing back samples sooner than, than uh, OSIRIS-REx, but our scientists are involved in looking at that as well. Another example uh, with um, Rugu uh, of looking at an asteroid. So then we have uh, exploration of ocean worlds. So we're exploring Mars as our nearest neighbor. We're exploring primitive materials and, and asteroids that we know have, can contain uh, water and organics. And we're also looking at ocean worlds in, in the outer solar system. And this is just a picture of um, the moons of interest that, that we have been considering to determine whether or not we think there's a possible habitable environment out there. And the two that I'm gonna talk about a little bit are Europa and Titan because we have missions now planned for there. And so Europa, all of us know this is one of our uh, favorite ocean worlds in the solar system beyond our own. And of course it's covered with ice and we don't know how thick that ice shell is. And beneath that we believe is an ocean that may be as deep as several hundred kilometers. And we're planning on sending a mission there to uh, interrogate uh, that body, to look at the surface, to understand more about it. But ultimately, we're interested in it because of its astrobiological significance between the charged particles that hit the surface, creating oxidants, and the reducing compounds that are formed through um, hydrothermal interactions. Um, we believe that it's highly likely that you can produce, uh, if those two are connected, you can produce the organics and the fuel that's needed uh, to support life. This is just a reminder to, to me to mention that there are differences between our own ocean and Europa, and you can see that both in terms of its depth, its salinity, uh, how much water we're actually talking about. Um, uh, Europa is a full cup, a full glass of water as compared to Earth, um, and, uh, but access is a little, a little tougher. Uh, nonetheless, we spend a lot of time here on Earth uh, supporting research and analog programs that look at the deep uh, ocean here on Earth, uh, that look at the interactions between ice and, um, and subsurface uh, oceans. And, um, and as always, for most of these other bodies in our solar system, they're not perfect analogs, uh, but this definitely is a focus that we have. And, and one of the reasons that we're interacting with NOAA is, is to be able to uh, explore all that we can um, using their assets and their programs for deep sea uh, exploring. This is just an overview of the Europa flyby mission. So it's the, up on the upper left is a table of how early we could actually launch if we wanted to, and if we used SLS, how early we could actually get to Jupiter to, um, to start the mission. Uh, the, the science tour is intended to be 45 flybys. Uh, if you actually launched in 2022, and uh, you'd have primary mission end in 2028, so within this, this decade, we could actually get information about, back about uh, some of the most important questions about the thickness of the ocean, the actual processes that may be allowing exchange be between the ocean and the ice surface, uh, and uh, maybe even understand what those brown minerals are that we see on the surface. 
So on the upper right is, are the science objectives that go into more uh, detail. Um, but uh, these are all uh, extremely important to our assessment of whether or not um, Europa is in inhabitable and inhabited. And of course, this will give us more information for future missions. Uh, what, and of course, many of us are very interested in the possibility of a lander. And I'm just putting this up because it's, it's gotten as far as the science definition team report, putting together what would be possible in a Europa lander study. It was based on knowledge at the time of the report, which is back in 2016. And I think this will continue to be of interest to the agency, although uh, we currently don't have funding uh, to move it any uh, far fur further. Um, we definitely have the funding and the obligation in astrobiology to continue to do good research to uh, enable this mission to guide um, both the design uh, and in terms of instrumentation and the measurements we want to take, uh, as well as uh, the technology for accessing and processing samples and, of course, interpreting what we then see. And then one of my favorite moons, which is the second largest in our solar system, is Titan. And this is a great example, potentially, of life as we don't know it. Uh, so um, biochemistry on Earth is water-based. Uh, and there is, they believe, a subsurface ocean on Titan. But is, what is more intriguing are the oceans and lakes that are visualized here through the near-infrared uh, color mosaic from Cassini. These are made up of methane and ethane, and it has a nitrogen-rich atmosphere. Um, there's a, this, any sort of hydrological cycle on this would, would you know, I, I say in quotes, would be of organic molecules moving through the atmosphere and the surface. Uh, and what kind of chemistry could you possibly imagine in a nonpolar environment with temperatures so low? Um, if this was, in fact, the chemistry that was needed to uh, permit uh, life to emerge and, and then thrive, life on this moon is going to be very, very different than life here on Earth. But to get us going beyond this original information from Cassini and Huygen, the Huygens probe, uh, we just recently selected Dragonfly. I think that was one of the most exciting moments at AbSciCon this year for me is when they announced that we were going to send a mission to, uh, to Titan. Um, this dual quadrocopter rotorcraft is going to land and explore. It can hop around and take samples at many places. Um, and hopefully uh, we'll learn much more about the chemistry on the surface and the potential for providing uh, the ingredients for life. Just a reminder, it's also extremely exciting that this is a mission that is uh, PI'd by um, Zibby Turtle, and most of her crew is, is female, so I think that certainly within astrobiology, um, I feel that we're very diverse and inclusive. Um, we attract early career researchers continuously. Um, we're open and supportive of, of anyone who wants to do science with us because we, we value not only the diversity in scientific disciplines, but also the diversity and perspective that are brought to us by, by different members of our society. Um, and so for me, this was really exciting to see that, um, uh, again, you know, astrobiology is pushing us forward, uh, pushing the agency forward uh, in having a very diverse crew for Dragonfly. And then the final thing I just wanted to remind you, and this is something that's extremely exciting to me, when I first took over as the head of the astrobiology program, that was back in 2008. It was only a few years uh, after we had discovered the very first exoplanet. And I certainly wouldn't have thought then what we know now, that basically when we look up in the sky, we're not looking at stars, we're looking at solar systems, and we're talking about billions and billions and billions of planets, and undoubtedly, just statistically, and for what we know about the structure of the other solar systems or stellar systems that we've looked at, there's likely to be terrestrial planets, and, they're like, and it's likely to, that some of them will be habitable. And we need to prepare ourselves, and the astrobiology program is essential in preparing ourselves for the upcoming missions that will look at um, exoplanets and try to understand uh, what they're composed of, what their relationship is in, their, in the, their stellar system, how they interact with their sun, 
uh, and what might be features that can be observed either on the surface um, with the, uh, something like the red effect or glint from oceans that would, can tell us if it's habitable and maybe even things that we can observe in the atmosphere that could tell us if it's inhabitable. I show this um, basically final slide um, that is uh, what they call the exoplanet mission swoosh. Uh, these are all the missions that NASA has planned, that ESA and the Europeans have planned to look at um, uh, you know, existing assets that can tell us something about exoplanets and uh, inform us about what we need to know about our own planets and our own solar system so that we can understand what's going else on elsewhere. And then beginning with uh, JWST and WFIRST, we start seeing other future missions that are planned, including those in consideration and being presented, um, I think as we're meeting even, uh, to the National Academies for consideration for the uh, astrophysics decadal survey, so that would be HABEX and Louvoir. And then across the bottom, I also wanted to remind us of how important our ground-based assets, um, both those in Europe and, and that are supported by the U.S. and Japan, uh, that are developing instrumentation specifically to allow uh, observations from the ground to assist in our uh, understanding of uh, exoplanets and what's possible. So I wanted to end with one of my favorite Carl Sagan quotes, that the nature of life on Earth and the quest for life elsewhere are the sides of the same question, or two sides of the same question, the search for who we are. I believe this to be true. I think all of us in astrobiology think so. I think these are incredibly exciting times. Uh, NASA's search for life is happening now. We've been preparing for it for over 50 years, and in the exobiology, astrobiology program, and moving forward, uh, we're gonna lead the agency in some of the most exciting discoveries ahead. So thank you very much for letting me speak to you. I'm really sorry I'm not there with you to, uh, to interact, but um, enjoy the rest of, of your conference. Thank you, Mary, and thank you for your continued leadership of astrobiology at NASA headquarters. So our next talk is from uh, Lindsay Hayes, who is a headquarters employee, but based here at Ames. And so uh, she's uh, going to be talking about the uh, RCNs that many of you uh, have heard about. Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you guys for having me here today. Thank you, Mary, for um, setting us up talking about the missions that astrobiology is uh, looking to contribute to um, as, as we go forward. Um, I actually, for those of you who are punctuation um, uh, people like I am and like to pay attention to this, um, it's not just the RCNs. If you notice, there's actually a comma there, and I intentionally did not use the Oxford comma here um, because what I'm gonna be talking about today is research coordination and networks. So two separate sort of ideas um, where we're going with the astrobiology community with research and coordination and these networks as two separate, uh, two separate pieces of, of our, our research portfolio going forward. So, so um, as we think about the astrobiology program evolution, uh, Mary mentioned her, you know, she started here in 2008 or started in the role in 2008. Um, and as we have moved through um, the past decade or so in the astrobiology program, we've seen a lot of changes um, in how the program as it was have changed into the program that we see today in terms of funding and resources and that sort of thing. So uh, the, the blue arrows here indicate um, that the exobiology program as it was in 2008, uh, when we had the big RNA, the Planetary Science Division's RNA reorg in 2013, um, things got switched up a bit. So exobiology, the majority of the research that was covered in the exobiology program, uh, transferred into the new exobiology program, which confusingly has the same name. Uh, but a number of things were changed. Uh, volatiles and the delivery of volatiles uh, to the planet and, and to other places in, this, in the uh, where we think about origin and understanding uh, life actually got transferred into the Emerging Worlds program. And habitability, the whole concept of what makes a planet a place that you may want to, you know, that evolution may have started on, that origin of life may have started on, um, or that life may be occurring on today, uh, that got transferred into a whole new program, Habitable Worlds. 
So um, that was the exobiology program. Um, ACE did the instrument development program that was the astrobiology uh, in 2008, uh, was, was as ACE did in 2010. It got merged with sort of other planetary science division instrument programs, um, and it got split into two programs, Picasso and Matisse, for sort of early stage instrument development and later stage instrument development. Um, <clears throat> a step uh, got merged with MAMA, which was the um, sort of a moon uh, analog environments uh, program in 2011 and formed the program P Star. And the NAI, of course, which we are here talking about today, uh, which was the source of sort of funding large awards, uh, starting this year, really starting in the next year, uh, will become the, uh, the research funding aspect of it, uh, will be this new program ICAR, so um, the Interdisciplinary Consortia for Astrobiology Research. And the coordination aspect that we see that the, that the NAI has been so successful in that has uh, really become the focus and the foundation of the astrobiology community is getting split into five different RCNs, or research coordination networks. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Nexus, Enfold, PCE3 now, um, and then one that doesn't have a clever acronym quite yet, uh, Earliest Cells and Multicellularity. Uh, four of these are up and running and uh, now is just about to have its kickoff meeting within the next month. Um, and of course, earliest cells and multicellular multicellularity is not quite there yet. Um, but these new research coordination networks is, is the way that the astrobiology program um, is moving forward in coordinating the community and really and re really creating a home for us to, um, to bring different aspects of research together. Um, and the, the, the coordination of these comes, um, comes from projects from other PSD programs, SMD divisions, um, and as I will mention coming up, um, in their own way, potentially even from other um, government agencies and such. Um, so this is where, this is where that, that comma was very important, funding and then research and coordination. So uh, the four new research coordination networks that will bring us to a total of five, of course, exoplanet system science is Nexus, life detection, and the focus there is Enfold, prebiotic chemistry in early Earth is PCE3, <clears throat> the Ocean Worlds uh, RCN is called NOW, um, and the earliest cells to multicellularity, as I mentioned, is coming soon. Uh, the goals of these different programs, uh, the nexus is really to understand the diversity of exoplanets, their history, geology, climate, um, sort of in a system science manner. PCE3 is looking to investigate the delivery, synthesis, and fate of small molecules under the conditions of the early Earth, and the subsequent formation of protobiological molecules and pathways that lead to systems harboring the potential for life. Enfold, investigate life detection research, including biosignature creation and preservation, as well as related technology development. And now to investigate the diversity of other worlds in the solar system and to learn how their history, geology, and climate interact to create the conditions for life. And I'll go a little bit into what each of these are doing. Um, ultimately, the fifth RCN, earliest cells to multicellularity, will be looking at uh, the earliest biological processes, the evolution into more complex systems. And one of the ways that you can think about uh, these five RCNs um, and this sort of gets at what many, Mary was talking about earlier, is that along this axis, um, these are the RCNs that are really uh, relevant to the missions and the future of missions and, and astrobiology-related missions as we're going forward. So Nexus, Enfold, and Now um, are really sort of looking at different uh, areas in the, um, in the solar system and beyond, um, and, and how uh, missions can address uh, different targeted environments or different targeted uh, goals. And then this axis is the fundamental fundamental research axis, I guess that's the northeast, southwest axis, um, is the more fundamental research. And so that doesn't, of course, mean that there's not fundamental research in Nexus or that there's not mission relevance um, in some of the others. But the point is really, um, when you think about it this way, you can see that PCE3 and, and from early cells to multicellularity, those are really getting at um, what we know about life, how we think about um, sort of major points in Earth's, in, in, in life's history, um, and what is the research that we can do uh, that, that helps us understand these questions. Um, so as this transition is happening, uh, the program has established four of the five planned new RCNs. Uh, the astrobiology program will conclude the NAI at the end of this year. 
um, as the CAN 17s are sort of scheduled to end. CAN 18s will continue their funded programs and become part of the relevant RCNs. Um, and any researcher funded by NASA RNA programs for projects that are relevant to the topics covered um, may elect to become a member. So uh, we do our best to, to see projects that are proposed and how they best relate uh, to the research uh, to the research in these RCNs. Um, but if you feel that you have a program or a project, <clears throat> I should have brought water up here. My apologies. Um, no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> oh, is there some over there? Oh, excellent. Pardon me. <laughs> young kids and I'm always catching something. Um, uh, additionally, of course, if you have research that is relevant, um, that, you, that you see a relationship between the research that you are doing, the projects that you are working on, um, there are ways to become a member and you get, get in touch with those uh, relevant co-leads. Um, the composition of, speaking of the co-leads, the composition of these RCNs, of course, is made up of uh, the researchers who have elected to become a member of any of the RCNs once they've received funding for a relevant project. Um, the leadership of the RCNs, there are co-leads, so there's the astrobiology program staff, along with representatives of the relevant elements from other SMD divisions um, to help us sort of understand uh, where we want to go with these. Um, they will, we will select the RCN co-leads from PIs whose research has been funded um, and who have elected to become a member. And then the steering committee is that broader group of people uh, comprised of all of the PIs of teams who have elected to become a member, both from the sort of large teams, and there's a typo here. Here, the eye care solicitation, um, as well as smaller teams from the relevant ROSES uh, programs. Um, there are also uh, two other ways, um, or there's, there's also some programs or some of the um, um, uh, some of the RCNs have elected to create an affiliates program. So if you are not funded to do this particular research or if you're funded to do um, related research not through a NASA grant, um, some of the RCNs have created programs that have allowed for um, those groups to become affiliates. Um, and so, so there's optional way. And then of course, the other way to participate in any of these activities is that all of the RCN activities um, are open to the public. And the idea being that um, these are just the, the steering committee of the RCNs, the people doing the things and organizing these groups and everything um, are creating these, these activities and everything like that um, in a way that sort of coordinates anybody in the community, anybody in the research community, the astrobiology community, who's interested in doing this kind of research or, or being being a part of this collaboration. So I have a couple slides now about each of the four RCNs that we have um, in place and sort of active at this point. Um, that you'll notice that they have very different looks as I move through the four different ones. Um, that is intentional, in fact. Each of the RCNs sort of has their own, um, not only do they have their own steering committee and co-leads and everything, uh, but they have their own goals and objectives and measures of success. Um, and so this is me, uh, this is me presenting them um, sort of in their own words, as it were. So, of course, Nexus is trying to look for life throughout the universe, Nexus Exoplanet for System Science. Um, Nexus is an interdisciplinary research coordination network dedicated to the study of planetary habitability and the search for life on exoplanets. The idea here is it's a cross-divisional system science initiative approach to exoplanets. Um, they we're leveraging NASA investments in research and missions to accelerate discovery and uh, characterization of potential life-bearing worlds. Um, the four co-leads are the four individuals you can see here, uh, the headquarters reps, as you can see. Um, and then this is their you know, great slide with all of the faces of the current Nexus PIs. Um, some of their goals and activities to carry out and propose interdisciplinary research. And in this way, um, you can see that they've actually measured success by increasing exoplanet proposals. Um, they have several proposals uh, submitted to the exoplanet research and topical workshops. Um, there were some grants awarded for those and workshops uh, resulted in new collaborations in exomineralogy. Um, another goal is to develop programs for using existing space telescopes and NASA facilities to advance uh, NASA science objectives. Um, you know, there was a working group led by Nexus as a Nexus activity on sort of early release science. Uh, two proposals, uh, you know, created one 70 or 23 percent of the allotted ERS time. Uh, make important contributions to science cases for future light flight missions, uh, leadership and significant participation in Louvoir concept studies, uh, discussion on the STDTs uh, impacted by Nexus research, Nexus biosignatures workshop uh, providing sort of state of the field, uh, community vision for biosignature assessment strategies. 
um, and to the goal of identifying new targeted technologies needed but not yet reported elsewhere. Uh, there's the Laboratory Astrophysics Gap List white paper that identified needed studies, to the goal of providing an increasing cross-divisional outputs to decadal review efforts. Uh, four white papers were submitted to the Astrobiology Strategy Study and seven to the Exoplanet Exploration Study by the National Academies. Um, asked to present at both of those study committees and both recommended, uh, both of those study committee outputs recommended nexus-like activities in the long term, uh, which we in the astrobiology program also took as a, um, a, a sort of positive support for this research coordination network structure. Um, and then there were 15 astrophysics to Cato 2020 papers led by Nexus PIs. Um, and finally, to the goal of enhancing U.S. leadership of international cross-disciplinary exoplanet researchers, 46% participation in JWST early release science working group was international researchers, um, and the Nexus directory developed at the request of international attendees um, to, to Nexus workshop. So um, Nexus, of course, as the, the big sibling, the bigger, older sibling of the RCNs, one of the original, or the original RCN, um, has shown, uh, has provided a really good model for how to do these research coordination networks in the NASA system and how to do it well. Um, they have had a lot of lessons learned along the way that they're passing on to some of the new RCNs. Um, and, you know, they have had a lot of activities um, in the almost five years now that they have been around um, that have allowed them to sort of uh, really start to, to foster this community. So telecons, workshops, walls, et cetera, et cetera. And so that gets us to the, uh, the, the, the second sibling in the RCN family, um, one with some familiar faces. Uh, so ENFOLD, the Network for Life Detection, is a multi-institution research coordination network focused on developing technologies and techniques for life detection on other worlds. Um, here are the PI, or the co-leads co are Tori Holler, Brittany Schmidt, and Sarah Stewart-Johnson. Um, <clears throat> the steering committee um, has PIs from a, a range of different programs. Um, the participation and membership uh, is, is the broader sort of steering committee group. Um, and I really like the Enfold slide that, that we have here that shows sort of all of the different topics that the different PIs that the different projects that are proposed working on, um, and then the different targets that they're looking at. And so you can see, you know, there are some fields that are stronger and some, you know, sort of cross purposes that are um, less well represented. Uh, but these PIs who are on the right side of the screen, um, the different projects that they work on sort of address these different topics in these different uh, focused areas to show that that Enfold and, and the research for life detection that we're looking at is really across the targets that were interested in astrobiology research and on a range of different topics. Um, so the objectives here to collaborate and to in, collaborate to investigate life detection strategies, uh, facilitate work between scientists and engineers, which is a really in crucial part of Enfold. Um, it's not just the life detection science, but it's also thinking about uh, the technology and the work that the engineers are doing there. Um, actively and inclusively engage a scientific community, cultivate interdisciplinarity and multi-organizational initiatives, uh, organize reference samples, coordinate community engagement with the ladder of life detection, um, incorporate Incorporating the ideas of agnostic biosignatures and combining different features of assessment and confidence, working with missions during the design phase to incorporate realistic life detection goals and objectives, and promote cross training and educational activities. And of course, um, they have started to, for some of these early activities, uh, building a website. You know, we have the steering committee project profiles. I believe we have a whole bunch of new information that either has just gone up, Tori Nod, yes, just gone up on the website. So I, if you haven't been there recently, I encourage you to go and poke around a bit. Um, the workshops and working groups are things that are they're looking to work on in the next uh, in the next year or so, um, and the working groups have actually been uh, created and they're part of this whole new initiative. Um, and so, greatness of life workshop, a planet, planetary decadal working group, life detection standards, early career engagement, um, and then of course there's the life detection forum project, which is about um, this this life detection forum, a way to sort of think about life detection um, in a systematic way. The third RCN is PCE3, Prebiotic Chemistry in Early Earth Environments. Um, the goal of this RCN is to investigate the delivery, synthesis, and fate of small molecules under the conditions of the early Earth and the subsequent formation of protobiological molecules and pathways. Um, 
there's a whole bunch of different topics here and the way they, the PCE3 shows to sort of show the relationship between this and this sort of circular diagram here. Um, a number of different topics, interactions between the topics are clearly and crucial or clearly important. Uh, here the idea is really to integrate the earth and prebiotic chemistry communities and break down the disciplinary barriers. Um, this is something that we see a, as a big problem, right? There you have a lot of geologists thinking about what the early earth is like, and you have a lot of chemists and, and you know, prebiotic chemists who are thinking about uh, what the different chemistry is and bringing these two groups together, breaking down, um, coordinating those two research as a way to sort of uh, foster a lot of new ideas here. Um, one idea is to develop, or one of the other objectives is to develop robust and fully parameterized models of early earth environments that can be explored experimentally and theoretically for their potential for prebiotic chemical pathways, promote novel and innovative experimental and theoretical approaches to exploring the origins of the sort of abiotic, prebiotic to biotic transition, um, identify planetary conditions that may or may not give rise to life's chemistry and sort of form the exploration of life. Um, and then finally, characterize geochemical and geophysical constraints of early Earth environments that can be applied to test, verify, validate, and guide existing and future uh, experimental and theoretical prebiotic chemistries. Um, the co-leads here, we have some of them in the audience today as well. Hi there, Tim. <laughs> um, uh, Karen Rogers, Lauren, Re Lauren Williams, Ram Krishnamurthy, and Tim Lyons, um, and then the steering committee as listed on the right. Um, and then the fourth and final and about to have their kickoff uh, meeting is the, the Network for Ocean Worlds uh, with the three co-leads, Alison Murray, Alyssa Roden, and Chris German. Um, the goal here is to develop science and technology research for exploring ocean worlds. Um, ocean worlds research is really important in the sort of three key areas, geophysics, ocean sciences, and life, um, ocean systems and life rather, and sort of comparative studies amongst ocean worlds, including the Earth, is one of the major um, ideas and goals of this network. The objectives is to identify and simulate novel directions of inquiry through enhanced communication with NASA's Ocean Worlds PI community. Um, so this is not just the Planetary Science Division community, but there's also um, a heavy input from the Earth Science Division as well. Pursue activities that both reveal and address critical knowledge gaps, uh, stimulate and facilitate new ocean world collaborations uh, to undertake high impact interdisciplinary research, identify and integrate research on Earth um, and other ocean worlds to catalyze synergistic studies, and to cultivate and augment the training of a new generation of interdisciplinary ocean worlds researchers. Um, I really like the fact that um, one of the things that I heard somebody say here today is that, I believe it was Dave Demeray, said um, that interdisciplinary science is the future of science. Um, and I really like the fact that RCNs um, have this ability. They have a lot of interdisciplinarity sort of baked in, and that's the point. Um, and there's, there, that's you know, one of the major goals, one of the major objectives of all of them is to think about it. So the metrics for success here, uh, research collaborations traceable to now activities, um, influence of now dissemination, disseminated information, expansion of the ocean world's community, and incorporation of now expertise into future flight missions. Um, this is sort of everybody who's related uh, to the, this community. Um, and I'll get to this and sort of a little bit more about this in a minute, uh, but sort of a vision for the future, thinking about the kind of stuff that Mary was talking about, um, exploring the solar system and beyond um, through, through missions. And of course, the fifth and final RCN is the, is the one that I'm, I am only representing here by this sort of vague coming soon. This is the earliest cells to multicellularity. Um, there's a lot of, uh, this is um, in some ways very fundamentally rooted in the exobiology, in the exobiology portion of the astrobiology portfolio. Um, but it's, it's another one where uh, there's potential for a lot of overlap uh, with other communities, um, not necessarily within the agency, but perhaps outside of the agency and other governmental um, uh, organizations and such, um, and starting to think about uh, not just what uh, the individual evolution uh, looked like, but sort of broader concepts about uh, multicellularity. So when we think about uh, research funding for RCNs and remembering that there are these two sort of cross-hatched divisions, um, you think about, you can see the fact that um, we have CAN-8 teams, we have habitable worlds teams, the, the ones that are kind of hard to see here um, in bold and italicized are things that are sort of funded wholly within the astrobiology program. Um, but there are other programs uh, that are represented in a lot of them, uh, in particular Nexus and NOW, you can see have a lot of representation um, from other PSD uh, programs 
programs, from ESD divisions, um, or also from astrophysics divisions. Um, so research funding from these RCNs is not only within the astrobiology program, uh, and that's part of the that's part of the point, right? That's part of the idea um, is that we're funding these. Uh, this is this is a broader community. This is bringing in people uh, who may not have originally been within the astrobiology community. And so the the one other thing, so so moving forward, and, and I think there were there were two phrases this morning that I really liked. Um, one was uh, Course Meyer's comment that this is the graduation of the NAI into something different, um, and this is this is fundamentally what we think about um, in in terms of exobio or in terms of astrobiology and the program moving forward and the program moving to its postdoctoral studies, shall we say, something that's a little more independent, um, a little bit more uh, self driven uh, kind of thing. And so the, the way to fund, we do still recognize, of course, the importance of the large teams and the large groups of people uh, who are working on a, you know, a consolidated idea for an extended period of time uh, that the NAI, that the sort of NAI model of research funding. And so that's why the Interdisciplinary Consortia for Astrobiology Research, or ICAR program, um, is, is a new program that we're standing up. Uh, within the astrobiology program. Um, the proposals here will describe a multi-million dollar five-year project with an interdisciplinary approach to single compelling question in astrobiology. Uh, we are looking here for projects larger than the scope of the individual research programs. So being an individual research, pro you know, a, a proposal to a roses or something like that, um, those will still have a place within the research coordination networks. And I think that's sort of what all of those last slides was demonstrating. Um, but, but this is your way to sort of also be a part of a bigger team and answering a bigger question. Um, then this year, uh, the areas of research emphasis in this solicitation are going to be linked to three of the five RCNs. So Nexus, uh, PCE3, and Earliest Cells and Multicellularity are going to be the three sort of topic areas that we will be soliciting this year in ICAR. Um, the targeting timing, the release of the first solicitation within the next month, uh, we are going through the lengthy approval process. I think we heard this morning a lot of people sort of uh, bagging on headquarters for various bureaucratic slowness in issues like, in related issues. Um, so we are, of course, uh, doing that right now, working on, uh, working through approval process. Uh, the, the proposals will be due in the first quarter of 2020. Uh, the goal, the targeted timing is that the new ICAR awards would support start in the third quarter of 2020. Um, all selected teams from ICAR would become members of one or more of the relevant RCNs. Um, so there's the potential for sort of a primary membership and then ties to a, another RCN, depending on what the research is. And the calls will, the, the, the intent is that the ICAR calls will occur on the order of every two years um, and will stagger the RCN topics to be included. And that is, I'm not sure how I'm doing on time, but that is, uh, that is the entirety of what I was hoping to talk to you guys about here today. I don't know if we have time for questions. Uh, we do. I can't I, see I anybody, so. Morning, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. So uh, my first question is, uh, what do people who may not be practicing in the three anointed areas for the inaugural ICAR. What do they do? What is their path to funding going forward? And, and what is the anticipated cadence of these solicitations? Sure. Question two and question three. Do you Ooh. envision highlighting certain RCNs <laughs> each iteration? Um, so let me do the second two because they're on this slide here and then I'll get to the first one. Um, so the, the first, the second question was the anticipated cadence. That'll be about every two years. Um, and the, you know, how will different, uh, different RCNs be selected? The intent is to stagger them, right? So uh, the intent would be that the next time uh, we would probably select the other two and perhaps a third one, depending on sort of the needs of the different RCNs. Um, and the, to answer your first question, what are the two non-anointed, I believe your words were, uh, RCNs, what are people intended to do at this point? Um, so the, the two that are not uh, being selected for this round are Enfold and Now. Um, and you can see that I have a list of uh, four, five things for Enfold and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, ten ish uh, programs uh, for now. Um, so the intent is, you don't produce, you don't propose a big team project this year, uh, but you pick a smaller, you know, you pick off a smaller piece and you apply to one of those programs. 
Any other questions for, uh, for Lindsay on this new architecture? Bill, here. Thanks, Michael. Um, just a question on, on the RCN steering committees. Sure. So that membership on the steering committee is voluntary, but, and, and the steering committees themselves don't have any budget, is, or is there a budget, in other words, to support the, the steering committee getting together, having meetings, uh, interacting, et cetera? So for activities fund or activities directed by the RCNs, um, those will be funded sort of independently, right? So if we have a kickoff meeting or something like that, uh, participation in that will be funded, ooh, sorry, uh, will be funded independently. Right. The activities, the other things are sort of a so so travel and those kinds of things, um, you know, participation in those types of events that require in-person attendance or those kinds of things. Um, those would be funded sort of in an independent way uh, by the program. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no, by the astrobiology program. Oh, okay. Yep. And then, you know, and then the other thing is, you know, we're looking at a, a, a telecon or something like it, we're looking at sort of minimal time um, for the for the rest of the activities. Any last questions for Lindsay? Okay, hold on for a mic. These are very good. I, uh, I was wondering uh, how uh, frequently the ICAR will be solicited like every other year or uh, the goal is to do it every other year yeah every other year yep so uh is there any particular reason that these two now and uh and fault was exclu excluded uh because those two first of all those two have um large teams already they have a number of large teams already uh that were selected sort of in the in the can eight call um and so those are teams that are relatively they, they have um, a large number of individuals at this point um and so we're looking to sort of boost some of the others where the numbers are a little bit lower Okay, how about outgoing uh, CAN7, for example? That uh, Well, CAN7 so had everybody. Um, so, so the intent is really to make sure that we have um, the balance of large and small teams to make sure that that balance is maintained within each of the RCNs. Okay, thanks. Okay, we have time last for one one more? okay, so I'll just quickly <laughs> ask it. Uh, you know, you indicated that the uh, Nexus, Enfold, and Now are eligible for mission considerations. Uh, not quite. More the, the, the intent more was um, that those three are the ones that um, speak more towards our, our mission goals and our goals in um, exploration. Um, well, they will hopefully address those issues going yeah. forward. Uh, but for example, the PCEE three goal would re include something like comet sample return. Of course, which would be extremely important I, for understanding that. I goal. do not disagree at all. Yeah. The intent was the three of those along that axis were more mission focused, um, and the other two, I said, certainly do inform missions okay. in their own way. Yeah, yeah. I was not no intent to diminish uh, the the mission relevance of either PCE three um, or the earliest cells to multicellularity. It's just that's more of a secondary yeah. aspect of what they're working on. The graphic may be just a little misleading. Maybe it could be. Apologies. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I try to speak to it as opposed to just putting it up there and smiling. Yeah. Where from, Mary Beth? <laughs> You get to speak now. You're in the next forum, so if you need to direct questions. It's actually questions a, good, it's a good connection. So um, <laughs> through the NAI, there were small pots of money like the DDF or the Early Career Collaboration um, funds that early career folks like myself could apply to for, for very small amounts of money that made a big difference in helping kind of getting money to help prepare to propose to these larger programs. Is there going to be anything planned, anything on the docket for early career folks to apply for through your new program? That's an interesting question. Um, I, you know, I don't think that uh, there's certainly, that is not something that has been, you know, discussed and ruled out or, you know, or decided as a positive at this point. Um, I think that there are other, through affiliate memberships and other things like that, there are other ways for early career folks to uh, participate in activities here. Um, we uh, will still, of course, have like the NPP and things like that that will be open to, um, you know, members of the RCNs and stuff like that. So, so uh, we, are, we are looking at different ways to make sure that we can help support the early career community. Lindsay, I have one more question. Uh, Carl Pilcher, in his remarks, identified a couple of potential gaps. I think Mary Beth just reiterated one of them. Another area is the international partners. How do you see them playing into this new architecture? 
Sure. Um, so, so the international partnerships is something where um, we are we are looking how to do that um, through the astro excuse me through the astrobiology program um, and directly you know through through the headquarters level activities. Um, there there have been some there there are things that we are trying to make sure that we um, we have everything done in the the proper channels and everything through headquarters right now. Thank you again, Lindsay. Thank you, guys. Okay, at this point, we are going to segue into a panel discussion moderated by Tori Holer, and this is going to be a discussion about a variety of topics uh, pertinent to early career scientists, early to mid-career scientists. So I'd like to invite up the five, uh, some of our five brightest stars. I was, I was going to say young stars, but to me, anybody younger than 60 looks young. So... <laughs> So we have, let's see, in order, we have Kath, uh, left, right, uh, Tori Holler, of course, Catherine Bywaters. Uh, let's see, we have Mary Beth Wilhelm, Sanjo Sanjoy Sam, Nikki Parento, and David Smith. And so Tori is going to moderate this. And at your request, after 30 minutes, I will give you a sign, and we will open it up for questions from the floor. Okay? Yeah, and if, if I don't see it, then start throwing things. Uh, I can do that. John can do Just it. Just not $20 bills. Yep. You're right I'm, I'm okay. all set. Uh, so if, if you look at the big accomplishments of the last two decades, standing behind the, you know, the remarkable scientific achievements, I think is the accomplishment of having built a cohesive community out of a collection of fairly distributed and, and different components. And to me, that is nowhere better represented than in the community of young scientists that's, that's sort of been created over the last uh, two decades, because I think it's, it's from my perspective, remarkably self-organizing, remarkably energetic, and, and remarkably empowered. And so I want to thank the organizers for including this topic in the discussion, um, because I think this really matters to, to think about, to have a conversation about. And I do want it to be a conversation, not just among us, but, but with all of you in the Q&A, uh, and, and, and how we can best support that community moving forward. I want to thank you for uh, the thoughtful selection of panelists, because as I look at them, you know, I think they represent a diversity of not only scientific perspective, but a diversity of, of when and how they came into this community. And so I think that diversity of perspectives is really valuable for, uh, for what we're going to talk about. And then I want to thank you for asking me to be a part of it, because this is, for me, a personally meaningful topic. I think it's a really important part of our consideration, something I've been thinking a lot about lately, and, and uh, I appreciate that opportunity. So uh, as, as we talked a little bit, um, let, me, let me first ask you guys maybe to give a little bit more of an introduction of yourself so that, so that people can have a sense of sort of how you came into the program, a little about your research, who you are, that kind of thing. Um, do you want to start, David? Will do. Good afternoon. I'm David Smith. I'm a civil servant here at NASA Ames Research Center. I've been with NASA for 11 years because I started in what used to be called the co-op program, now is called the Pathways Program so that I could actually bounce back and forth between NASA Field Center and Kennedy Space Center back then and the University of Washington, where I was studying astrobiology, a dual title PhD program in astrobiology that I was really lucky to land into. And uh, most of my research is in the area of microbiology. Um, I've been very fortunate to have astrobiology program support. I can say a little bit more about that later, but I guess I'm still really in disbelief that I'm here at NASA Ames and that I get to practice astrobiology, like Mary was saying, we're doing this now. And I still can't believe it and I feel very grateful. I'm Nikki Peranto. I'm also a civil servant here at Ames. And my path into the program actually started with a planetary biology internship program in 2003. And then I applied for an NPP, a postdoc position. And then I was with SETI on soft money for five years, and then I was hired as a civil servant. Um, in terms of the research that I do, I focus on microbial biosignatures as a way to understand the origin and evolution of life on Earth, but it's also relevant for life detection on Mars, ocean worlds, and exoplanets. Greetings, friends of astrobiology. My name is Sanjay Sum. I'm a research scientist with the Blue Marble Space Institute of Science, uh, and I sit in the exobiology branch at, here at Ames. Also, your co-host for Ask an Astrobiologist. Uh, I overlapped with uh, David Smith at the University of Washington. Uh, I discovered astrobiology while in graduate school, so fairly late in my academic career, and it uh, 
caused me to change majors after a master's. Uh, so thrilled to discover this community. And I uh, came to NASA Ames uh, for a postdoc and uh, really valued the community that, ex that existed on site and uh, always found that community first, career second, and decided to stay here for that reason. And my research has uh, it, uh, follows two paths. One is in Precambrian environments and another with uh, water rock uh, geochemistry and bioenergetics. Hi, I'm Mary Beth Wilhelm, and um, I guess my, f my first exposure to astrobiology when it was when I was a high school intern here when I was 16, and um, it's something that has propelled my entire career and shaped it um, as it was happening. Um, and I finished my PhD two years ago. I also, like David, was part of the NASA Pathways program, so I had the opportunity to be um, fully uh, ingrained in this, the, the research going on here at Ames since I was 19. And um, so I finished my PhD two years ago. Uh, I'm an organic biogeochemist, so I studied the preservation of biomarkers in analog environments primarily, and now I'm pretending to be an engineer <laughs> and um, <clears throat> starting to develop new types of instrumentation for life detection. So it's a really cool new opportunity and new style of working for me. Catherine Bywaters, I came to Ames through the NPP program, and after that found a wonderful home at SETI. I work on, I love extreme environments. I think one of my earliest exposures to extreme environments was going out to Utah and then to the Canadian high Arctic. And it just blew my mind on how organisms can not only survive, but thrive in these extreme environments. So that kind of set my love for astrobiology. And then coming to Ames and having just this feeling of such a strong community really empowered me to want to stay and continue to do this work. And so now I work in analog environments as well as uh, life detection instrument development and different ways to go about looking for life within the solar system. And uh, just a little about me so you don't wonder who I am. Uh, I'm Tori. I got to Ames in 1998, uh, almost exactly the same time that NAI got to Ames. And I feel like I've kind of grown up within the program. I, I uh, think I put seven leaves on the NAI family tree outside this morning. So, um, so I've watched this whole thing evolve from its origins uh, up to this point. And, and um, that's been a fun thing to be a part of. So I'll tell you that, that we all met to discuss this panel a little bit uh, so that we'd come in prepared for it. And one of the first things that, that really became clear is everyone had something that they could point to as a, as a particularly positively you know, impactful uh, influence on their career that resulted either from what I think Carl Pilcher referred to as, as focused support or from the culture that exists within our community, um, you know, or, or, or you know, purposeful support and dedicated support of the early career community. And so I thought a great place to start would be to ask if each of you could uh, point to a few of those things that have been really meaningful for you because they then become things that we can identify and make a point of carrying forward uh, to ensure that we continue to support the community. So uh, please, you can fight amongst yourselves to see who goes first. I'll go first. So for me, uh, one of the most pivotal moments of my uh, graduate student career was actually uh, AbGradCon. So in 2009, uh, 10 years ago now, my goodness, AbGradCon was in Seattle at the University of Washington and myself and some grad students uh, proposed to the DDF uh, so, you know, mid-20s, writing your kind of first proposal to get money from NASA to organize a conference for NASA students and the NASA community it was a huge deal. And uh, really showed me that um, I, was, I was fortunate to lead that group that working together can be so much more impactful than the sum of our individual parts. And that really gave me the confidence to that building a team to solve big problems is something that I enjoy doing and that uh, I value contributing to a community and gave me the confidence to launch uh, the Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. Uh, fortunately, it's six months later. So uh, AbGradCon for sure was a pivotal moment for me. I guess I can reflect on a couple of things quickly. Uh, I'll, I'll go as far back in time as I can remember, I guess. I, I grew up in the middle part of America where there, wa there was no NASA presence. And I, I told my panelists I was probably gonna cry at some point during this, by the way, because I get very emotional about this. You know, and so, you know, you're passionate about space flight and I was passionate about life and biology and search for life, but I had no clue, like, where to even begin that. And the Astrobiology Institute had a really good sort of, I would say, marketing and messaging method where it really felt like 
it really felt like uh, a lighthouse in, in a way, you know, a beacon of, hey, here's what you can do. And that, and that for me meant, you know, the books I could read, the, the websites I could explore, and ultimately the institutions that I could go study at. So I'll uh, recover my shaky voice and let somebody else talk. But, you know, I really, really appreciated how much effort the NAI put into, you know, blasting the message out all across not only the country, but the world. I can go next. Um, just to, to reiterate kind of what, what has been said is that welcoming and the support of a community. I think as an early career researcher, you don't always know where to look or who to ask. And I feel like the astrobiology community does a good job of trying to support each other. And something just recently was the you know, crazy idea got kicked up to have an astro virology workshop uh, mm -hmm. online. And just from one person having that idea, being able to bubble that up, that got implemented. And it was a two-day success. It was an online event. And it just, it really gives you the kind of the warm and fuzzy feelings that anyone can have a good idea. They can approach uh, the, the leaders in the community and actually see their ideas, see something be created from their idea. So that sort of support, I think, is invaluable, especially when you think of astrobiology and all the different innovative ideas that come from the community as a whole. There needs to be a way to, to support that. And I think that that's really been translated well through the NAI. Um, kind of more from my own experience, um, when you're sort of faced with the complexity of becoming a, a NASA scientist and um, trying to re recruit those resources to be able to do the work you're interested in. Um, the NAI provided um, these small pots of money that you could apply for. And um, that really helped me, particularly in the middle of my PhD, because I had, I had a lot of ideas and I had, um, you know, I had a lot of ideas, but not a lot of resources. And uh, one in particular, there was a collaboration fund that allowed me to sort of hop from lab to lab. So I got to spend time at Goddard and MIT and then Eventually, it brought me back out to Ames to work in uh, Nikki and Linda's lab, Linda Jenke's lab, um, and that really helped kind of jumpstart my career. And and it's sort of like I realized when you're writing proposals, you have to have money to make money, and so it kind of gave me that initial push to start to start to break into the game, which I really appreciated and, and really helped me professionally. Yeah, I mean. These are all really excellent points. And I think in general, you know, these smaller pots of money have provided really critical training for all of us to be able to transition into applying for bigger Roses, Roses programs, which quite frankly can be really hard to break into. And so I am gonna be really forward and actually plead to have the headquarters folks here that the new RCNs, or at least the astrobiology program, try to maintain this type of student training and, and student money. It's not just, you know, training to write proposals, but it's about community building as well. And, and you know, again, just tr trying to figure out, because a lot of these processes, um, even like figuring out how to contribute to white papers and, you know, planetary um, decadal survey and things like that, it can be a little bit of a mystery. And so I think, again, having these training opportunities, having the ability to interact a little bit more one-on-one -on -one with senior researchers and, and learning that process has been absolutely critical, absolutely critical. Thanks. I think uh, if I can be a panelist for a second and put my moderator hat to the side, I want to add something because I had an early career at 1.2. Uh, the sun was a little fainter then and the moon was orbiting closer to the earth, but, uh, but I still remember it. And what I remember is that, that especially in the first half of these two decades, there was a real emphasis on education and outreach. And when I came into that world where, where that was a, a significant part of what the teams did, it's not something that I would have ever thought to seek out unless it was sitting there right in front of me and unless I was sort of pulled into it actively. And it turned out to be one of the most meaningful and, and um, valuable parts of my career. Because I think to take someone who is young and at the outset of their career and ask them to go and tell the public how they're spending their dollars and why, and to convey the sense of excitement that brought you into it helps you constantly recapture that same sense of excitement and that same sense of purpose. And so that's something that, that for me seems to have changed over the years and that I would love to see become a big um, emphasis again. Uh, so, so please. I just want to riff on you a little bit regarding the public outreach. Uh, one thing that I found extraordinary with NI Central was the trust they put on early careers to get shit done, quite frankly. 
and uh, I benefited a lot from that from the Lewis and Clark, but on the public engagement side of things, I remember we, several of us early careers, um, before we finished our PhD, proposed to, uh, to, to NAI to start a astrobiology social network where, where us early careers in astrobiology could engage with the, with the public at large on kind of the, the social media world. And that's what started Saganet, and that has evolved a lot over time. And one of the early programs of that was uh, talk to an astrobiologist, which I think several of you have been on the program, where at first we started with some pretty crappy technologies to, to stream you as you talked to the public. And now it's a program that is supported by, by, by NASA, the astro astrobiology program, uh, with, with resources and, and technology and so on. So I'm, I'm hoping th this, this ability to, to reach out to astrobiology leadership to have out of the typical path of science ideas and that can be supported to promote science outside of what you usually do will we'll continue. So I think that for, for someone entering the field now, someone just starting their career in the field now, exactly because of the amazing science that's been done for the last 20 years, the scientific landscape is quite different. So for example, I think the, the possibility of missions that actually go to look for evidence of life are much more tangible than was the case when I started. And so, so I wonder, relative to your own experiences, how do you perceive the, the, the set of challenges and opportunities as being different now than it was when you started your career or when, when, when this whole field got going? And what does that imply for the kind of support that we should provide to the early career community? Someone's got to volunteer. I'll jump in. Um, I mean, I like that you're asking sort of the forward-looking questions as well. And I can just reflect on where I'm at in my career. You know, So I spent a number of years kind of building my knowledge base and performing basic research. And I do a lot of lab and field work. And now with the emphasis on, on missions, particular life detection missions, you know, it's learning how to translate that research and that field work into mission. So I've learned a lot, and you'll probably hear from Alfonso de Villa later, how do you translate into that into a science traceability matrix, for example, to the ELSA, um, the Enceladus mission proposal? Um, I feel like I need more training in that, so that might be a, a broad request is, again, if the emphasis is going to be placed on missions, like we need more training and help in translating all of that research. I think sometimes we tend to only think about what the future of astrobiology looks like in, in, in the science composition and the future principal investigators and co-investigators and instrument developers. But I, I want to encourage for, I guess, especially anybody online that's listening that's early in their career that NASA needs future science leaders and project managers and, you know, getting an mission off the ground, so to speak, and on its way to its destination requires so many other skill sets and talents and efficiencies. And uh, we have a changing workforce and lots of leadership opportunities will be available. And people that have a science background and engineering background are gonna really make a difference plugging into those places. And so I think that's changed a lot, at least uh, in the last 15 years since I've been playing in the uh, astrobiology sandbox. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, like <clears throat> I think it's really important to focus on cross-training as well. So when I'm in a meeting with my engineering team, I need to be able to communicate with them and they need to be able to communicate with me so we can translate um, the basic science into engineering requirements that then um, that don't stray too far away from the science goal. And it's, it's, really, not, it's really not easy. <laughs> it's, a it's, very, it's a big challenge. And here at Ames, we have a couple of um, kind of early stage development programs, such as the APEX program, which I can, um, participated in last summer, to help us kind of gain that training. How do you write a science traceability matrix? How do you, how do you condense your science ideas into, into goals and objectives that are mission worthy? Um, how does that constrain your, your um, engineering of your mission? And and um, how do you perform the science without, um, you know, terrifying your engineers too much? <laughs> so these are all things that you have to start to think about, and um, they need to be rooted very strongly in the science. Um, so something, now that I'm sort of like looking forward into the next stage of my career, I think it's important to start to think about how we create pipelines to do those things. So it's not just kind of early stage, and then you, there seems to be this air gap <laughs> between that early training and then the actual mission concepts. So I've been thinking a lot about, you know, that, that middle ground. <clears throat> yeah, to build on that, uh, they don't tell you in graduate school that the PhD is the easy part, right? Then you have to figure out how to write a proposal and bring in money, and then you have to start figuring out, well, how does my proposal fit into NASA goals in terms of mission, and then how do I even integrate myself into a 
mission if I'm a biologist. It seems like biology, astrobiology is finally just maturing now to be a technology-driven discipline, which has not been the case for the past 10 years. And so having a, maybe not an RCN, but maybe an early career coordination network where the goal of this group is to, to tailor programs to take graduate students who are freshly out of their PhDs into knowledge and how to write a proposal and how does the NASA beast works in terms of getting a flight mission. I mean, we joined NASA because we want to do flights, right? That's the whole idea. And so, but it's really hard to gain that knowledge and that experience and to know the right people, to find mentors who are involved in these flight programs, to have a pipeline, like Mary Beth was saying, to reach those goals, so. And just to throw in my two cents, um, I have to say I'm very excited about the current state of astrobiology and the potential moving forward. The landscape seems to have shifted recently and astrobiology is something that everybody is now aware of that buzzword or they're, or they're learning what that means. It's not just a select few that are aware of astrobiology. It's, you know, our, our legislation is aware of life detection missions and wanting to push that goal. So I would say the future looks really bright and it's, very, it's a very exciting time because it's, it's this big push for looking for life now. And with that, I would say what would be beneficial for early career scientists is learning how to communicate your ideas. You can have a fantastic idea, but if you can't break it down into an elevator pitch that everybody can understand, it's very difficult to get that, that idea off the ground. So learning how to communicate a complex science idea into a little nugget, I think is very, very important. I want to pick up just a little bit on the idea of a, of a pipeline, right, for missions, because one thing I think has changed as the science has progressed and missions have moved from the more traditional sort of planetary sciences, planetary geology and astrophysics to things that incorporate more and more biology. Uh, it means that we need to take people who, who for, for whom there is not an existing organic pipeline from graduate school to mission leadership. Um, the, the expertise that's needed, I think, is distributed across a much broader set of disciplines, many of which don't concern themselves very much with, with NASA uh, efforts. And so that to me also represents kind of a, a new set of challenges, right? To take people who aren't traditionally part of the mission landscape and make sure that there's a well-established mechanism for them. And maybe we shouldn't be relying on, on the existence of sort of organic development mechanisms. Maybe it needs to be a dedicated thing. I mean, there is a PI mission workshop that's happening next week in Tucson, but I was surprised that one had to apply for it. There should be knowledge that's open to anybody who's interested in doing missions. So, I think so I'm not early career, but I'm going to weigh in here because I have some relatively new information from headquarters. Uh, so I talked to, uh, I guess it was Michael New a couple of weeks ago. So this workshop you are referring to is, I think, next week at the University of Arizona. And uh, Thomas Zerbuchen is very passionate about this very subject and training the next generation of researchers to bridge that air gap and enter mission land. And so he intends to repeat these workshops every six months. I think the next one's going to be at the University of Michigan, which is where he came from. So I think there will be additional opportunities, many of such opportunities. And I say that for the people on the panel, but also anybody in the audience here or virtual, uh, there will be additional uh, PI, I forget the name of it, uh, launch pad workshops. Yep, that's awesome, thank you. Do you, do you want a chair and, and an honorary early career badge? <laughs> I mean, part of it is on us too, right? Everybody up here, everybody that kind of came into astrobiology when we did because I look around the room and the names online, and it's like people lifted us up, people taught us how to do things. And I hope it will bubble up naturally from the RCNs, but we also need to train our replacements, right? When we get to these places we want to explore, we will not be early career. Some of us aren't even early career now. So the point is, uh, you know, we got we to gotta make sure that we do that. We don't have single point failures anywhere in uh, research communities. So we've, we've been talking mostly about missions, and I think we've heard the term mission, mission, mission at least twice today, if not more. Uh, and, and I agree, that's an absolutely pivotal point of focus for all of our efforts. But in my mind, missions are something that emerge and are supported by a broader context of basic research. I think that you can spend an entire career being a basic researcher in order to be a better contributor to a mission. And so I wanted to ask your opinion on how we keep that part of things vibrant. If you're not actively part of a mission, but you're, you're doing this broader work, what do we need to be doing to make sure that, that that's well supported? 
Well, I was heartened to, to hear in Lindsay's presentation that there's still fundamental research within the astrobiology program emphasized, in particular within the exobiology at Rosie's program. Um, you know, I'm, I recognize that I'm a civil servant at Ames and, and missions have to be part of my proposal, but I still do a lot of basic research. And so it's important to keep that going. I think that, you know, all of this still has to be science driven. It can't necessarily be instrument driven. Uh, so, yeah, just, you know, uh, continuing the funding of the basic research and uh, I guess that's it. <laughs> Uh, so, so I guess I would wonder also about, about activities beyond basic research. So community service activities, for example, that, that you know, where, where we use our time as NASA employees to, to buoy up the general research enterprise to support the general state of knowledge. Um, do you see things that we can be doing there as well? I mean, we've tried internally, for example, with Center for Life Detection to do something along those lines. Is this a seed question for the life detection forum? <laughs> it's, it's not, I promise. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so uh, part of what we need to do is community service. And so again, it's, it's helping the community to translate that basic research, again, making it relevant to missions, the mechanism that we're using now is the life detection forum. And, and Tori, you can certainly speak more to that. But even I think community wide, like for myself, I'm, I'm challenging myself now to not just think about like characterizing biosignatures, but really um, focus on uh, developing a framework for their interpretation. And so that's de you know, detecting the biosignatures within the abiotic noise. More workshops can be done that, that will support that and get at that. You know, I did, I was lucky to have the opportunity to co-chair an exoplanet biosignatures workshop. That group really focused on developing a framework for interpretation. And as a community, I think they really moved the field forward by doing that. So I think more workshops to support that endeavor. But also independently of our of official programs, at the end of the day, we're all funded by taxpayers' money, right? Should be our own prerogative to return that information to the public informally at dinner or, or, or however we can, or, or even on, on perhaps more official fronts. Um, uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi is, is my, my rep in San Francisco. I connected with her office during the recess in August, and now I'm, I'm in touch regularly with her office with all kind of cool science ad updates that are relevant to what I think is important that should be funded. Uh, that's something that's not hard to do that we could all do um, and be a louder voice and, and good neighbors here in Silicon Valley. And, you know, as I reflect back on coming up through the NAI support and astrobiology program support, I mean, I guess a lot of it, it felt like a safety net in a way, scientifically, when you're doing inter interdisciplinary work, um, you, you, hit, you hit a lot of barriers, you realize how little you know, often you write a lot of proposals that don't work out. You get Lewis and Clark fund support for a field study that was supposed to last seven days, but lasted one because you didn't pack the equipment and supplies properly. So like all of those kind of false starts early in your career, being able to fall back on a community, whether it was Astrobiology Science Conference or AbGradCon, or even just like Carl Pilcher, you know, giving you that talk, uh, it was a confidence booster and so important. And it doesn't have to be astrobiology. Any early career scientist has their series of failures. So um, having that community connection to back you up and pick you up when you're down was super important as I was moving through my progression. I would also say that we should look for more collaborations with commercial uh, entities. Uh, commercial space, space flight is really taking hold and I think there's a lot of opportunities there for partnership and development and to guide the te technology that's being developed from these commercial, these commercial companies to really go in the direction that we want to see it go. So I, I think that's something that we shouldn't overlook and that the young early career people should, should tap into as well, especially being here in Silicon Valley. There's so much available to us and their companies are open to talking to you, wanting to collaborate. There's different workshops. I think one just actually happened here at Ames about partnership. So I would, I would say, take advantage of that. Yeah, I want to emphasize also what Mary Beth said earlier about the small pots of money that exist to cut our teeth on, right? The Lewis and Clark funds where you try to have a logistical field campaign and fail miserably, and that's okay. Have small pots of money to, uh, to start a little research project and it doesn't work, and that's okay, but you get positive feedback from, from people who have more experience. Those things are important. We can't go from zero to 100. We can't propose a mission. Uh, right out of the gate, you know? So it's important to have those small pots of money that are available for early careers to kind of 
chew on and understand how the process and feedback works. I heard, I heard David say the other day that, that by that virtue, he felt empowered to take chances and, and sort of able to be courageous in terms of the directions that he tried. And, and I thought that was a really beautiful way of summing up, you know, what, what leaves you very well positioned for a career where you can sort of pivot often uh, and, and, and do the things that matter most. In a lot of ways, it was a shield. Um, I'm, I'm, I've only been to graduate school in one place. I don't know what it's like at other institutions, but once you put your you know, d dissertation committee together and you know, suddenly you have four faculty members from four different departments, like, what? You know, initially when you're talking to your advisor about that, I think it would have been a very difficult conversation to explain why you needed to have these different areas. But under the umbrella of astrobiology, using the shield that was the NAI, it was just, it was, it was easy to do and it was encouraged. And, um, and, and that's super, super important. Yeah. So I think we're at the point where we should probably shift to questions, but I wanted to ask, is there anything that we've left unsaid? Uh, any, anything that you really want to put out there uh, that's meaningful to say? I was just thinking back to what you were, you, Nikki mentioned about basic research. And I think it's also important, like as we as scientists do our, our research, um, figuring out ways that we can communicate that to the community beyond just, just papers. And the community extends beyond just our scientific uh, collaborators and colleagues. Um, you know, thinking about how we can boil that down to something like we've been working on with the Center for Life Detection and translating that into requirements or into, um, into parameters that, um, you know, as we start to develop mission concepts in the future, uh, how, like what information is relevant and, and making sure we, we, we tag that while we're doing our basic research. They don't necessarily have to be done at the same time, but I think it's a good reflective thing to do after we've completed a project. Um, Rose Grimes this morning talked uh, in her presentation, make many magnificent points about uh, gender equality. And I want to talk a little bit more about diversity that was not touched upon uh, in the talks this morning. Uh, teams, and it's been shown in the literature, work better when they are diverse. I know NAI has been doing a lot of work with uh, supporting minorities uh, getting involved in astrobiology and my minority students uh, getting involved with astrobiology research. Uh, I hope this continues with the, uh, the new astrobiology programs. I haven't heard anything about that this morning, um, but it's important for our community. We will, we will benefit from it. Absolutely. Yeah, and I did hear the presentation that Thomas Urbuchen gave on, on, you know, cultivating a broader base of people that could potentially be PIs. And, and I hope through these workshops, you know, that really happens. Um, I think that there's a diversity of perspectives that aren't necessarily represented now. And I think that there's so many people out there that could, could contribute that aren't necessarily part of that pool yet. All set. Are we ready for questions? Okay, good job, guys. Thanks. Uh, any questions for our panel? You may have to borrow two mics here. Yep. Hi. Um, so a friend of mine is an aspiring scientist working on a PhD program, and she's like pre-early career, I guess. And so I'm kind of curious, uh, what advice would you give to someone who is trying to kind of hang on to that sort of like, you know, enthusiasm and aspiration to even get in the door to figure out how to work the network and, you know, fundraise within the beast. So like, how, how do, what, what's the spearhead that gets you the opportunity other than like, don't give up? I can give, go that one. Community first for me has been the, the biggest uh, rock in terms of not giving up. Uh, but plenty of crises in grad school when you go up and down in your, uh, in your ability, in your thought at least, of your ability to, to succeed as a scientist. Um, but but for, your, for, your, uh, for your friend, um, I would ask them to join saganet.org. Frankly, it's a community where, where people just like that connect with us and we have people connecting from all over the world who want to know how to become astrobiologists and there are a bunch of resources there. And there's a platform to ask questions and, and early career professionals are there to answer. Uh, and um, and so th there there exists these these platforms to to kind of to share the love. A, a terrible way to say it, but um, there is a community out there that supports these people. Uh, not only that, certainly the the community aspect is is has been built and is. Um, there and, and very welcoming, but there are a number, because I, I get questions from, you know, I do, as Dave mentioned, I participate in the um, 
this last master biology intern program with high school kids for the last 10 years. So I get a lot of questions from students at so many different levels, from high school to um, to undergraduate to graduate. You know, how do I get involved in astrobiology? So, you know, NASA does have a number of different internship opportunities, and so I myself have benefited from those internship opportunities. So I always point students to you know the website and say, here are a variety of different things that you can apply for, like get involved, do a summer internship. And for many people here, I think that's sort of the entree into the program. Um, okay, so I actually have mostly comments, sorry, not questions, but the, it's Melissa, and thank you all of you for being up there because I know you would love you all. And I just wanted to let everybody know that many of the early career programs that were started through the NEI will continue through the astrobiology program. So Lewis and Clark, that many of you participated in, and the Early Career Collaboration Award, at least for 2020, they'll be there as well as at GradCon. One thing, however, that we won't have is the director's discretionary fund, and I sort of wanted to, I don't know where Michael Bacay is, but you know, I don't know, there is a, an AIM Center director's discretionary fund. I don't know if there's a thought of perhaps having an early career you know, portion of that, or I see Chris Dadios here, you know, that, that I'm gonna point on every, you know, at everybody here at AIMS and say, maybe there could be something available for AIMS researchers to try, you know, just to give a little seed money to try out a project. And then just wanted to make a call out to the Astrobiology Program website that does have um, a link for early career researchers on pathways to become an astrobiologist. That's an easy way for people to get some general advice. But I'm just you know, so excited by what all of you said. And sorry, Sandra, one more thing is, the, um, is to get underrepresented people involved in astrobiology. We need to find some new ways. We've tried a number of things. And you know, as Carl mentioned earlier, some of them have had more success than others. And I think we need to try some, some new ones and, and see what we can find. There must be some good, good um, models out there that we can follow on. Thanks so much, Melissa. Was there, was there another question? Hi there. So uh, I'm Vic Nanda. I'm at Rutgers University, and I'm one of the PIs on the CAN8 uh, NAI. And I'm a synthetic biologist and a protein engineer at a medical school. And that's already a little bit of, I'm a little bit of an odd duck, you know, in my department. Uh, and I know that the astrobiology community is incredibly supportive, but I'm still a little bit reluctant, even with tenure, to call myself an astrobiologist at a medical school. And so one of the things that we've been thinking about as we sort of spin up our uh, institute is the training side of things. We want to develop an undergraduate uh, major in astrobiology and maybe even a graduate program. I know there are very successful ones at UW and at uh, Penn State. But uh, from an, sort of an early career perspective, what are the advantages and disadvantages of calling yourself an astrobiologist, particularly if you're spending a lot of your time not interacting directly with this wonderful community? And maybe what should we be thinking about as we develop a training program in this area? I can answer the second part. Uh, the University of Washington had research rotations in the astrobiology curriculum, and that could take place just in another department's lab, but it often was out in the field. And you know, as we think about developing missions and instruments too, I think for the most part, all of us love to get out there and do field work. It's a great way of learning. And if Rutgers has any mechanisms for facilitating that, something that I would encourage. So I did geosciences in Antarctica. I'm a microbiologist, had no business going down there, but I learned quickly out there in the field. I think we're all odd ducks in astrobiology. And I would say own it in terms of calling yourself an astrobiologist. And that goes to all of you who are senior scientists who have like a lot of weight in the, in, in, in the, in the scientific community. Call yourselves astrobiologists. The more people who do that, the more it's going to be okay to call oneself an astrobiologist. And it is already okay to call oneself an astrobiologist. Nothing wrong with that. So own it. Call yourself an astrobiologist at the medical school. I was just going to say, and you too can speak to the UW program, but uh, you know, you certainly want to develop a strength in a core area, a core field of expertise, and then branch out from there. Uh, astrobiology is extremely interdisciplinary, but I've also had friends who've done a number of different you know, early career programs from the astrobiology winter schools and so on and so forth. And what one of my friends said to me, she said, I feel like I'm spread too thin. You know, I know a little bit a lot about a lot of different things. And so I think for me, I kind of, the message I took from that is, yeah, you really need to develop a strength in, in a core field. So I call myself, a, you know, I guess a geobiologist and also an astrobiologist. 
there other questions out there? Or shall we help do our part to get you back on time? Lynn. Make a comment. I'm, I'm rather touched by the way you, this impression that everyone who's over a certain age is all knowledgeable and everything else in your early career. And so, you know, it's like the joke of the, you know, the kid who goes with his grandfather to the baseball game and says, well, it must have been so primitive. You know, what was it like without cell phones and stuff? It was terrible. So we invented them. We helped invent things like AbgradCon and so on. And I'm delighted that it's been so useful. But where I think there has been the gap even for <clears throat> more senior people, is learning how to conduct missions. And so I encourage people like Michael to remember the rest of us who also have not got training in it. It's not just, you know, we are all power, knowledge, knowledgeable and you're not. A lot of us could use that training. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The special over 60 <laughs> So uh, there's a dirty little topic that hasn't come up, so I'm going to bring it up but uh, uh, through a narrative anecdote. So I was back at headquarters a few weeks. Uh, this is probably a week, a uh, month and a half ago. And I'm sitting in the cafeteria in the, in the salad bar downstairs, and Thomas Zubukin comes and pulls up a chair. And we ended up having a fascinating half-hour chat. And he's asking me what's on my mind. Well, there's a lot of stuff on my mind. But one thing that I decided to have enough uh, cojones to bring up was some slides that Mary Wojtek had presented at the National Academy of Sciences earlier, earlier this year showing the selection rate for some of the astrobiology programs. And they were between 12 and 17%. So we had a discussion about, uh, and I proffered my opinion that I thought that was an unhealthy situation. Um, just for point of reference, the overall SMD selection rate has declined from the low 30s uh, 10 years ago to roughly the low to mid 20s now. But in astrobiology, we've, you know, NAI has actually been so successful, they've created such a large community and their research funding has not substantially gone up. And so it's causing a real problem. And so I will only tell you that he and Lori Glaze got back to me and said they are committed to getting the minimum selection criteria up to a certain level. I'm not going to tell you what that level is. And this is a tough job. I tried to do this when I was back at headquarters in the 90s. And it's the third rail of NASA because RNA, even though it's a relatively small pot of money in a $6 billion enterprise, it's partition out to various program officers who all feel like it's their money. And so if you try to do a rebalancing, which is what I suggested, in part on proposal pressure, you're going to take money from somebody and give it to somebody else. That is very difficult to do. I'm just telling you that I, they heard me, and I'd be curious to see a year from now whether the selection rates in some of these programs have gone up. So thank you very much to, excuse me, all of our panelists and, and to Tori. And uh, we come back. Uh, the break is right across the atrium here in the administration building. Don't worry, we'll sanitize you when you come back. And uh, we'll start again at 3.30. We have a couple of canned presentations from Jim Green and from uh, Lori Glaze at NASA headquarters. Thank you. <laughs>